I'm happy to welcome you all to a web seminar organized by CFS in Frankfurt jointly with SAFE. My name is Jan Kranen. I'm the scientific director of SAFE and I will basically lead you into today's event. There will be further speakers, um, of course, most prominently Markus Blondermeyer and his discussant Paul Tucker, and later his commentator Ottmar Issing. And everything will be moderated by Rainer Klump, and there will be further introduction as we go along. I want to say just a personal remark in the beginning before I hand over to the main speaker of today. And this personal remark is my own experience and probably many of us have shared similar impressions. My own experience of a certain degree of embarrassment when the COVID crisis developed from China over various parts of Europe and finally arrived at my own place at uh, Germany, at the heart of Germany. The point is that this COVID crisis had a long, I would say a long tail. It came along, we could see it almost physically coming closer and closer, but it did not, at least in my own thinking, start to make me change anything in my behavior. Actually, there was very little preparation for the shock that soon is, was expected to hit our economy, to hit our society, to hit our university, to hit our school. It appeared as if COVID as, a, as an event that, that basically stops and closes many activities in the economy, in, uh, in schools uh, and, and in everything that uh, makes up society, could be observed on every evening's TV, but it didn't immediately lead me to think, now what can I do to prepare when it arrives at us? I always had the impression it will just stop, will stay where it is, and it will not migrate any further. At least that was my own thinking, or more feeling than thinking. And despite all the warnings that arrived, there was little preparation. Actually, COVID itself had been an event that had been predicted many times by scientists that it will happen some, someday. So I think that much of the shock that we experienced was also due to the fact that we were not in a way doing exercises in preparation for such so shocks. And uh, when I talk about COVID, uh, that is only one particular example. There may be many others uh, also lying ahead of us when we think of climate change, let's say maybe a similar thing. We all know it, we all talk about it, but what are the real preparations that we are undertaking? Uh, and I think it is very important that thinkers that academic, that's not only academics, but to a large part academics, devote their energy to understand, to understanding what's going on and how we in the political system, in the economic system, in the rest of society can respond. What can we learn from these experiences? I think it's always a big challenge to do this, to learn what, what can be done. And not many are really capable of bringing quickly this experience to a, to a clear expression, to a point that everybody else can share this, um, this thinking and this, this analysis. And I think one of the persons who can do it uh, very good, maybe better than most others, is Markus Brunermeyer. And so I'm very happy to, to introduce him in this um, seminar series. We do this because he has written a new book, uh, which, which has uh, the, the title is uh, almost a story, so there will be much more explanation, of course, but forming a resilient society makes you immediately think about what resilience might mean. And I don't uh, say anything about the book, uh, but I just say you hear the title and you start to think what could resilient society probably be? And immediately you have some ideas that lead you in a certain direction. I think this is the main, in my opinion, the main contribution of Marco's uh, book in this case, that he makes us think in a particular way about historical events. He has done this before, 
in his life. And despite being still young, he has already left a huge trace in our economic understanding and our thinking. Um, and I think he is, um, for, for that reason, one of the, I would say, most outstanding scholars uh, of our times in the area of macroeconomics and finance. Uh, he is formative in his thinking, so many people work with the concept that he has been developing. He bridges macro and micro. He has a clear and a very deep understanding of the working of markets, what is most uncommon for macroeconomists, I have to say, being myself a finance um, academic. And uh, he's not only this, that he leaves uh, and, and, and teaches other um, scholars in doing their research, so uh, not only a leading researcher, he's also leading in translating these ideas into policy advice. So he's a leading advisor, and those who, who, who observe a little bit where Marco's name pops up in the political area knows that his thoughts, his contributions are taken very serious uh, by, uh, by, by, by policymakers. Um, <clears throat> he's also one of the most popular um, uh, hosts of a webinar. He's almost a David Letterman, I, I noted, of, uh, of finance, macro finance, in running an, an academy, Marcus Academy, which has a, a very large audience around the world on, on talking to, um, to both academics and policymakers on macro and, and finance. And finally, he's a prolific writer of... Um, of common access books, of books that everybody can understand, that translate his theoretical concepts into a language that everybody can read and, and enjoy. And I think we are we are we learn something about his latest endeavor in this in this field. Uh, that not many among us do this, bridge all these capacities. And I think uh, I just want to mention uh, um, some of his the books that he has been writing. One on the financial crisis, bubbles, financial crisis, and systemic risk. Uh, one on the euro and the, the, the euro system, also on the, on the regulatory side, uh, the euro and the battle of ideas. Um, and, uh, and most recently now, this book on, on the resilient societies. There are more books, but he does all these efforts simultaneously. I don't know how many Marcus really exist in real life. <laughs> you have a twin or something, but this is very, very... Um, in, uh, in impressive. And maybe last word I want to say is about concepts. Markus is a person who thinks in big concepts that we can take away and, and work with. And I just want to say a few of the words, uh, coin, terms that he coined, and I think the resilient society is, will become one of these terms. But he, he wrote, a, uh, a developed a concept, COVA, that allows us to, to think about uh, risk measurement for in terms of systemic risk. Um, he has talked about um, safe assets in the euro area and found a term for that. And, and there are many other terms that he has been uh, really pushing forward and that are in a way um, now um, in, the, in the greater commons of our thinking. So I'm happy to welcome Markus um, today. And we are very eager, I think, to listen to your presentation of your book. Before you start, I want to hand over to Rainer Klump, who will formally um, uh, address uh, the next section of our webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. Um, good afternoon and welcome also on behalf of Center for Financial Studies. Um, as uh, Jan already explained, uh, the, the main speaker today is uh, Markus Brunnermeyer from Princeton University and director of the Princeton uh, Bentheim Center for Finance, uh, presenting his uh, fascinating book on how to build a resilient society. Uh, we are also glad that we uh, have uh, uh, Sir Paul Tucker as a discussant. Uh, Paul, who is currently a research fellow at uh, the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. And as uh, most of you will know a former central banker who has served uh, under in, in a time of crisis in, in central banking, which um, I think makes it very interesting to hear his comments. And I'm also glad to welcome uh, Otmar Ising, uh, the president of CFS and uh, uh, former 
chief economist and board member of uh, first Bundesbank and then the European Central Bank. I think that will be a very interesting panel to discuss uh, the issue of the resilience and the resilient society. And without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to Marcus. Just let me mention that uh, for the Q&A, those who have questions, please use the Q&A function and I will then um, uh, arrange the, uh, the, the answers by the panelists. Thank you very much. And Marcus, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Rainer and Jan, and uh, thanks for this generous introduction. I hope I can at least come a little bit close to the expectations you have raised to the audience. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, SAFE and CFS in Frankfurt and talk about my new book, uh, The Resilient Society. And as you probably can imagine, a lot of these insights came from my webinar series, so I put them together in this book and put it around a theme of resilience or resilient society. So if you look into the future, then we will actually face a lot of shocks. We will face potentially new pandemics, new viruses might come or anti-resistance of bacteria and other problems. We might face another financial crisis. We have faced already some cyber attacks that might become more severe, the natural disasters, and there are new uncertainties coming with new technologies. Uh, you know, we, have, we will have some human engineering and other aspects and typically when a crisis comes, it doesn't come alone, it comes in pairs or uh, in triplets. So the question is, how can we set up a society which is resilient to these shocks? And I would like to make the case, there's a difference between resilience from robustness and also to avoid any risk. And I would like you know, build up a, a, a framework how to think about a resilient society as opposed, let's say, to a robust society. And one way to picture this difference between robustness and resilience, robustness is essentially a concept where you withstand any shock. And one way to see that is if you compare an oak, an oak is very strong. If the winds come, it will stand still. And compared to resilience, which is much more, you give in, but you bounce back. So you react to shocks. And so it's like a reed. So it's like the oak stands very still while the reed constantly is volatile. It seems like much more risky the reed, but there's a big difference. If the storm is so strong that actually the oak falls over, the oak cannot stand up again. So there's a robustness barrier. If you break this robustness barrier, robustness will not help you up. And while the reed is always standing up, and it actually goes back to an old fable by La Fontaine, a French writer of the 17th century. And he says at the end, or the reed says essentially, I bend a bow, but I don't break, while the oak might break. break. So that's essentially what I call this volatility paradox, where essentially you, can, you see the reed and you think it seems like it's much less stable, it's much less robust, but at the end it turns out to be more robust than or more resilient than uh, the more robust oak, which at this, if there's a very strong wind, it actually it breaks. And this also means you might want to be uh, exposed to small shocks because you learn how to react to these shocks. And that's, for example, if you think about the human immune system, if you live in a very sterile environment, it's a very robust environment, but you don't learn how to re react to shocks. And that makes you actually vulnerable later on. So that's essentially one of the lessons. Don't look at something which is very, very stirred and very strong. It appears very strong, but it might break, while something which might appear less strong, but it constantly is moving, is agile and reacting. That actually is much more resilient. And we should actually have an economy and a society which you know, is able to bounce back. So the important lesson is to bounce back. So robustness is not equal to resilience and resilience might appear to be the weaker form, but ultimately turn out to be the stronger form for our society. So the second issue, issue I would like to raise, robustness uh, is resilience is also not like avoiding any risk. So while the risk is you know, very much a static concept, you can think of a variance, you avoid any amplification or amplitude of shocks. Resilience is a dynamic concept. So in rather than thinking about minimizing variance, 
It's about optimizing the mean reversion that we bounce back. So what I've depicted here essentially is you have a shock and then you bounce back. So it's not necessarily that you hold up the shock, but you make sure that it will bounce back. And this is for any shock we might face. You know, that's for example, we developed very good vaccines, which allowed, allowed us to bounce back potentially to a new normal. But actually it's very important to have a society where there's some innovation, there might be some mavericks in the society who can actually then design within an open society new ways to bounce back, which we haven't imagined before. But you have to have a society, an open-minded society, to really have the ability to bounce back. And let me make this a little bit more drastic, what it means risk avoidance versus uh, resilience. And what I've depicted here, I've depicted here two paths. And the ability to bounce back allows one to take more risk. So I have one path, which is, you know, has no risk at all, the dashed line here, that's totally riskless. And there's another path which is risky, but it always faces some shocks. You might think that's like a business cycle almost. But the risky one, if it has the ability to bounce back, it has a much higher, on average, in the long run, uh, trajectory in terms of growth. And actually, one should actually pursue the more risky but resilient path rather than the riskless path, because in the long run, we would be much better off, even though it might appear more risky and less desirable in the short run, but in the long run, it is actually much better. That means you want to go for innovation. You want to try out new things. You do Schumpeterian you know, a competition, but even though it might occasionally lead to some uh, setbacks, but if you can bounce back, then it's not uh, so important. So what is important is to really distinguish between different shocks, between the shocks which really lead to so the ability to bounce back in shocks where you can't bounce back. So let me go to this a little bit. So what are the three levels of resilience? So you have resilience at the individual level. So you can actually, you know, bounce back on your own. There's a lot of things written in psychology, how to be more resilient. You know, that's uh, the book is not focusing much on that. It's much more focusing on the society to be resilient. But you can develop human capital, you have certain freedoms which allow you to bounce back, or you can train yourself to be more resilient. You can also have resilience in the system, it's like in networks and global value change. You have certain redundancies and buffers, for example, buffers in form of equity and cap banks, which makes the system more resilient. But what makes a society particularly vulnerable to shocks is essentially the interaction between externalities and responses. So there's some endogenous reaction of others. And that's how the society is built up. And you would like to have a society where things don't spiral out of control because somebody causes externalities, this next party is reacting to it, makes things even worse, and you get this feedback loop. So let me illustrate this with just two people here. There's person A and a person B. The person A acts and causes a negative externality on person B. And then person B suffers from this externality, okay? And the person B suffers from this externality, and then the person B reacts to that. And because it reacts, it causes an externality on person A. And the person A then uh, reacts again and causes a more further externality on person B, and the whole thing spirals out of control. You have this feedback externality. So it's not only an externality which is bad, which we know, but it is not, it's in addition that the other persons react to that, make things even worse and cause an externality going back. So it goes back and forth and makes the situation worse. And that's why we need a social contract, which avoids these type of form of feedback externalities. So we have the social norms, which can prevent that. We have laws. And um, we also, to some extent, have some market arrangements, which help to avoid these uh, feedback externalities. So there's certain resilience destroyers. And one of these resilience destroyers are these feedbacks. Another resilience destroyers are traps where you just pushed into a trap. You can't get out of it. There's a point of no return. And for these things, one has to watch out. One has to design the society, the social contract, and the laws in such a way that we don't get stuck in that. A third form are these tipping points, 
where you essentially, you are on a path over time and the path goes downhill and at some point you hit a tipping point and then you spiral out of control, possibly because of some feedback loop kicking in. One of these is, for example, in, in climate change, if the Gulf Stream is uh, stopping and once there's a tipping point, you reach it, there's no way back and Europe will be way, way colder for a long time to come. So avoiding traps, feedbacks and tipping points is the key to do so. And that has to be part of our social contract. The, the way of you call social contracts in this book is very much a la Tom Hobbes and John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but it's a, give it a very much an externality interpretation. And there are two forms of externality a social contract would like to limit. One is externalities from others, in particular this feedback externalities, but you also would like to have some social insurance externalities from that mother nature. So sometimes you are hit by a shock, which is like an externality from mother nature. And we would like to have some insurance across that. And the question is how, what type of insurance do we want in order to provide resilience? It's not necessarily just I give you money if you hit by a shock, but I give you also the dignity to bounce back. So I help you to get out of the hole you were pushed into. And this gives you dignity on top of it because you can bounce back on your own. And that is the resilience in, 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 in the phasing essentially shocks. So what the book does, it goes through the COVID crisis and it goes across many, many areas where you can have resilience. It's typically resilience means you have redundancies, but you have some potentially redeployable redundancies. So you can have resources. If something is hard, you can redeploy the resource and reallocate your agile and react to that and you have a flexible response. You can have this with regard to health. You have seen this with the vaccines. We reached a new normal with the vaccines. And it's just, you know, not uh, just managing the crisis, not enough. You also have to find a way to bounce back. And that's essentially the, the key. I talk about the macroeconomic aspects, what the low interest rate does. The low interest rate actually gives you more fiscal space and more fiscal resilience but it gives you less monetary resilience because you're closer to the effective lower bound. And I will talk here today much about the financial aspects, you know, efficient debt restructuring to avoid debt overhang. That's, you know, resilience because you can actually uh, overcome some over debt overhang problems. Re capital requirements like uh, are more like a buffer is more like a robustness approach or in international context, having flexible exchange rate combined with macroprudential regulation that people or companies don't have too much dollar debt or foreign denominated debt. In this sense, flexi flexible exchange rate provides some resilience for the economy. If you have a lot of foreign exchange reserves, that's more like a buffer approach, more a robustness approach. And then there is, you know, distributed ledger technology, which is very resilient because all uh, the ledgers are replicated and in many, many different computer systems. We have to rethink the global value chains going away from a just in time to a just in case um, a phenomenon. And then, you know, we will talk a little bit about global geopolitics. There's a whole chapter on the global role of the dollar and the global geopolitic aspect. And there's also then uh, a chapter on climate change, how to avoid tipping points in the climate change and what is the connection between sustainability concept and the resilience uh, concept. Let me go today a little bit into the finance aspects. There's no, I cannot do justice to what all of the areas uh, in, in 30 minutes, but let me just say robustness is more like having big equity capital. They have a buffer, redundancies, resilience is easy debt restructuring, and you have a lender of last resort by central banks. And I would like to talk about the financial market whipsaw and just explain what happened in March 2020 and why did we bounce back so dramatically and so softly um, immediately after March 2020. So the first thing is there was a stock market decline, radical decline, and then uh, suddenly a rebound. And uh, there was a you know, record IPO issuance like during the Nasdaq bubble in the late 1990s. That was one phenomenon. The other phenomenon was that the corporate bond market was actually coming back dramatically. And actually we had more bond issuance in 2020, that's for the US, than any year before. And that's because the central bank, the Fed in particular, took away the tail risk 
I said, if you can't issue the copper bonds, if nobody wants to buy it, the Fed will buy it. It just, it didn't buy many of the corporate bonds. It was just standing ready to buy. And suddenly everybody was willing to buy the corporate bonds. And many corporations were then issuing new corporate bonds. To the extent they issued corporate bonds and paid out equity, that actually made the whole system less resilient. But one has to be aware of the power of the central bank to act as a as a resilient enhancer, but has to be careful that it does not issue bonds just to level up for the companies and then paying uh, it out. Now, that's the stock market, and there's a corporate bond market, and then there's the US Treasury market. And the US Treasury market suffered in March 2020 as well, and it almost lost the safe asset status, which is unheard of. So everybody wanted to get out of the US Treasury and get uh, essentially uh, Federal Reserve Reserves. So the way I think about this, the government bond market shivers is essentially, the one has to understand what is a safe asset. And a safe asset is, has two features. One, it's a good friend. And second, there's a safe asset tautology. What's a good friend? So a safe asset is like a good friend. You can sell it at a reasonable high price whenever there is a crisis particularly in times of crisis, when you have a personal crisis, because you have suddenly your car broke down in your car or your washing machine broke down, or you have some healthcare expenditure. And you can always sell it a little bit on ask spread. So you can easily trade it back and forth. There's not much asymmetric information in there. In such an asset, people would like to hold some precautionary savings in such an asset. Hence, such an asset, the asset price is not only the discounted cash flow, but it's also the discounted present value of service flows. It has this additional service that at times of crisis, I can have some extra aspects to it. That means, you know, the issue of the safe asset doesn't have to pay so much cash flow. It doesn't have to pay such a high interest rate in terms of cash because it gives this extra service. This asset gives this extra service. And that makes the interest payment on government bonds fairly low potentially below the growth rate of the economy. And once that's the case, you can actually run uh, very easily some government deficit uh, as long as that can be guaranteed. But it also means you run essentially a bubble or a Ponzi scheme. And as you know, these Ponzi schemes and bubbles can burst. And that's what the safe asset tautology is. A safe asset is safe as long as it's perceived to be safe. But once this perception goes away, the safe asset feature goes away as well. So they pop like a bubble. So it's a very unstable situation. And one has to be aware of that, that this might pop uh, occasionally. And when it might pop, when you have, for example, the bid ask spread is widening. Suddenly you don't have this nice feature anymore that you can sell it at the low bid ask spread. And that's what happened in March, 2020. In March, 2020, suddenly the US Treasury was not trading at a safe low bid ask spread. And the central bank stepped in as a market maker of last resort, not as a lender of last resort, but as a market maker of last resort. And the reason was actually already regulation beforehand, which made it very hard for market makers to be active in the Fed US uh, treasury market. And you can see here, uh, that's a picture taken from Daryl Duffy, you see the market making activity, the bank balance sheets in the market making activity actually was not growing relative to the US Treasury. Actually, there was enough, not enough market making capacity uh, going on before the crisis. And that showed really in March 2020. And the Fed stepped in as a market maker of last resort, managing the US Treasury to ensure that the market making activities will be maintained, the bill ask that will be maintained. And with it, the safe asset status of the US Treasury will be maintained, which is a backbone of the global financial system. And that was very, very important to step in very fast and intervene in this and take on this role as a market maker of last resort. Of course, the Fed stepped in even more, not only being a market maker you know, on both sides of the market, it also absorbed of that. So it was more than a market maker. It also bought a lot and kept it on the books which is more than being a market maker of last resort. Now, of the other aspect which uh, is shown in the book that we have this high public debt at the low interest rate. What does resilience mean? That you prior to a shock, you always have low fiscal debt levels. And if there's a shock, you can then use this capacity 
and avoid the shock. And so it also means when you have good times, you should build up your physical capacity again. And when even, you know, even if it's not very attractive, it might be politically more attractive not to do so. And the second thing I would like to highlight is that you have to be aware that you might lose your safe asset status. And if you don't behave prudently, and there might be suddenly an interest rate spike. So rather than looking at the debt to GDP ratio, which is a common statistic, we should actually look at the debt servicing cost. And you might say, oh, they're very low. You know, we have high debt to GDP ratio, but the interest rate is so low, so the debt servicing costs are reasonable. But I would not look at the debt servicing cost itself. I would look at the value of risk, value at risk uh, at the debt servicing cost. How much can the debt servicing cost spike? And I think that's the variable one has to look at. It's of course a more complicated variable to understand. But if it is the case, you know, that you have the interest rate currently low, but the interest rate might spike, can you actually avoid the spike by suddenly uh, having some extra fiscal capacity to support the high price of the current debt? Or can you not support it? How much monetary space do you have? How much fiscal space do you have? And that's essentially will affect and the value at risk of the debt servicing cost. And I think that's what we have to look at, not only at the debt servicing cost, but really at the value at risk of, uh, of the debt servicing cost. So that's on the fiscal side. On the monetary side, and the financial side, we saw a financial whipsaw. It went really down and came back. On the inflation side, we saw the same thing. So we saw essentially inflation going down significantly uh, to zero and then came back up everywhere in the world. And of course, you have two traps. As I said, traps are resilience destroyers or resilience killers. And one is a deflation trap and the other one is the inflation trap. And initially it looked like, you know, we have huge decline in, uh, in, in inflation and then suddenly it came back. So why was it the case that initially inflation went down so much. Of course, there was forced savings. But one way to see that, you know, despite these huge stimulus checks, which were sent out in the US and in Europe, what did people do? They put in their checking accounts at their banks. And the banks were then holding the reserves at the Fed or at the central bank, the ECB. And then through QE, the central banks were buying some government bonds. And the government bonds were, the, were issued in order to finance this, a stimulus check. So essentially, it didn't really affect the demand for goods at all because everybody just got stimulus checks and they, ultimately the money was held in a checking account in order to ultimately channel back to the US Treasury or to the finance ministry in the responding countries. So you see for the US, you see this huge increase in personal savings. And because of this huge increase in personal savings, uh, that didn't show up immediately in inflation. It only showed up later uh, in inflation once the personal savings are going down again. Why were the personal savings so high? First, there was forced savings. You couldn't spend anything because of COVID. And then there's, of course, increased uncertainty. This uncertainty leads to more precautionary savings. And that, you know, mutes the inflationary pressures. But once this uncertainty goes away and things calm down, we will have inflation, we see it already inflation coming up, and we might have an inflation trap. It's another resilience killer. And how can you ensure that you can control inflation? I think it's very important to avoid fiscal and financial dominance. Fiscal dominance, meaning that if you raise interest rate, if the central bank raises the interest rate, the fiscal authority will react to it by cutting expenditures or raising taxes in order to bring everything in order again. If there's fiscal dominance, they won't do this, and the central bank will be uh, unable to essentially uh, control inflation. The other thing is financial dominance. Financial dominance can occur because the central bank might be reluctant to raise interest rate, knowing that it will create havoc on the financial markets and destroy uh, parts of the economy. So in such an environment, the central bank is actually slow in reacting to inflation pressures. And we also see inflation popping up and being then under control. So what's really important is some guards against this uh, independence of central bank, which is in Europe enshrined in the international treaty. So that's uh, against the fiscal dominance. 
And against the financial dominance, you would like to have very good macro potential regulation to make sure there won't be this over leverage, there won't be this highly in unstable financial system such that the central bank is afraid to raise interest rates. And I compare this a little bit like a, a, a good system is, is like a race car. So you have the ability to put the accelerator on because you know you have good brakes. If you have good independence, good microfinancial policy, you know you have good brakes. If you, if the inflation picks up, you can actually put the brakes on. So in times of crisis, you can also put more the accelerator on. If you don't have the brakes, you better be also more uh, careful with the accelerator. And that's what's going on. So another thing on the international market, of course, we saw in March 2020, not only were people reluctant to have the US Treasury, they all wanted the US reserves, everybody wanted to get out of emerging economies. And this is just a picture where you see the decline uh, in billions of dollars uh, from emerging economies. So that's the flows out of emerging economies during the stress period. This is comparing uh, the taper tantrum, comparing the global financial crisis, which is the light blue line, the taper tantrum is the pink one, and the China scare. When you see the COVID crisis was way more dramatic and much, much faster as well. So it just fell off a stone. And, of, and then because of the Fed intervention, the Fed interest rate cuts and the Fed repo facilities it put in place actually came back and now the emerging economies that can help themselves, they could refinance themselves very easily to such an extent one is worried if the Fed is keeping the interest rate low and then suddenly has to hike the interest rate more dramatically later on, there will be havoc in the emerging economy. So it's time now to build up the macro potential buffers uh, for a potential hike later on, a late and more dramatic hike later on. So let me uh, uh, conclude with this. So the, the book covers a lot of things it goes into geopolitics, and I, I hope that uh, Sir Paul Tucker will talk about this more in detail and, and climate change. But this is essentially what the book tries to do, capture uh, all the different aspects, what we have learned from the COVID crisis, and always through the, uh, the lens of a resilient society, making sure that we have everything uh, put in place so we can bounce back. And not be discouraged. If you want a robust society, you need so many redundancies, and so many extra layers of help that it's not feasible. A resilient society is feasible because on the one hand, you can take more risk if you bounce back. And what you really want to avoid are risks which are from which it's impossible to bounce back. And uh, I leave it at this. And uh, thanks again for giving me this opportunity. And thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to discussing this by Paul and Otmar. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus, for the great presentation. Yes. And I hand over to Sir Paul Tucker. Thank you very much. I, I, I should plead with you all only to use the Sir once. Please call me Paul from okay. now on. Um, thank you to Jan for inviting me to be part of this. Huge congratulations to, to Marcus. Um, Hello to Otmar and hello to everybody that's watching, which is a kind of pretty giant audience and it's deserved. Um, as Jan said, um, Marcus deploys some key concepts in this book and the ones I like very much are resilience, externalities, social norms and shocks. I don't find the um, concept of a social contract um, particularly useful but actually, in the context of, of, of Marcus's book, this doesn't matter. If For someone like me, if you substitute the words legitimate institutions every time that Marcus uses the word social contract, um, um, you can the argument can, can proceed. So nothing turns on my kind of anti-Hobbesian, anti-Kantian, anti-Lockean, but Humean view of um, social institutions. This, I'm going to come back to resilience in a, in a moment. The second thing to say is that all, all of this in the, in the book is explained with exemplary um, clarity. So, um, so any layperson who ha hasn't been through the MIT or Princeton, Harvard machine um, or worked in economics can, can engage with this book and, and take a lot from it, both the general chapters at the beginning and the end and also the particular um, applications. I, I want to offer, to show the richness of the idea of resilience, um, I want to offer 
three examples. Um, one where I want to introduce um, a slight difference from Marcus, but not a fundamental disagreement. And then I want to say something very quickly about geopolitics, and then I want to ask Marcus a question. But obviously, Marcus can select not to engage with any of my comments or whichever one he likes. First of all, the idea of resilience. I didn't see this in the book, but I think you'd agree. Actually, systems of government can be resilient or non-resilient. And I think this is incredibly important for our world, the world of constitutional democracies at the current geopolitical conjuncture. Because I would argue, and have, have argued in the past in, in my book, An Elected Power, that democracy, constitutional democracy, is, is more resilient than one party rule or authoritarian um, government. And that's essentially because it separates how we feel about the government of the day from how we feel about the system of government. Um, particularly in a system like the Westminster system, you can vote out the party in government um, and you can dislike that or be very frustrated with that particular government without at all being alienated from the system um, of government. Whereas uh, um, if, if, one, if one was a, a citizen subject who ended up being very disappointed or alienated by one party authoritarian government, um, it's not obvious what the system of how the system of government is separate from how you feel about the the party. I think this is a kind of um, <laughs> actually a massive thing for the Western world, broadly defined as constitutional democracies, to hold on to over the next half a century. the The second example I want to give is very current in the UK press um, at the moment, or actually is current just in the UK and a bit elsewhere, which is. With rising wholesale gas prices, um, there is enormous pressure um, on lots of smaller energy suppliers in the UK. And if you want to believe the newspapers, and I can only rely on the newspapers, it seems that some of them may um, fail um, and some of them may or may not get rescued by the government. And a key thing here is that um, a little while ago, uh, Westminster governments introduced a cap on energy prices. So if you put these things together, if you have um, a liberalized wholesale um, market and a liberalized domestic market in terms of low barriers to entry, but a cap on, um, on retail prices, well then if wholesale prices spike, um, some of the, the retailers are gonna go bust. And that doesn't matter if there can be a, a frictionless switch of supply to the remaining companies. Um, and it doesn't matter if there is an efficient resolution regime for the distressed companies, but otherwise it matters a great deal. So actually this was the policy of domestic liberalization plus a cap was absolutely not a policy that could produce a resilient um, system unless one attended to um, the financial condition um, and, and bankruptcy regime. For the supplier. So this is a, an example of, of a non-resilient um, system. And the one question I would like to introduce here, which Marcus may or may not want to pick up, which is why is it that um, modern governments around the world um, um, are so poor at thinking in terms of resilient um, policy, of only ca not catering for shocks, um, but only thinking about the central um, case. The third example I want to give is on finance, and, and Marcus put some emphasis on the rescues of March 2020. Well, this can be taken at two levels, and I think there's an important point here, which is that once one introduces the, the central banks as a form of US cavalry, yes, the system as a whole um, proved um, resilient and financial markets didn't close. But the question is, first of all, could the private system have been more resilient so that the central banks had to intervene less? And did they intervene in ways that leave us with problems? Marcus described it in part, the actions of March 2020 as in part a market maker of last resort operation, um, an idea I'm quite keen on and I'm partly associated with. Well, a market maker of last resort would sell their, um, their holdings as soon as markets began to function again which they did fairly soon afterwards. And also to the extent that they were buying, the central banks were buying government bonds in huge, 
quantities, given that they pay interest on reserves, they were actually doing a debt swap where long duration government liabilities became short duration um, government liabilities. And that may have made the public finance public finances much less resilient. So in a sense, there was a kind of fix the short term um, resilience problem in financial markets, but transfer it maybe to a longer run um, resilience um, problem in the public finances. And when certain finance ministers talk, perhaps for the first time in for my generation, um, I'm, I'm in my mid 60s, about con concerns about interest rates rising, one thinks that actually the structure of debt management may have been screwed up by, um, by QE. So there's a kind of different levels of resilience and there are kind of different, there's a term structure of resilience in certain circumstances as well. The, the penultimate thing I want to say is that in geopolitics, I think one right now for the, for the, for the foreseeable future, I think one has um, quite a complication in all this. Um, William Nordhaus, as part of the Marcus Academy and elsewhere, has argued that you can think of the climate policy game as embedded in a trade game to the extent that one could use trade sanctions if people, if states didn't comply um, or participate in important um, global climate agreements. And I agree with that as put, but actually the trade game is, is embedded in a security game, which is what, what happens if, if actually there are tensions between superpowers. I'd want to argue that a global system depends on some kind of global order. So this is, if you haven't got some kind of something that preserves resilience, meaning safety at the highest level, then what do you do? And then finally, Marcus, very quickly, um, there's a question of pecuniary extern externalities internationally. In, in, in a domestic setting, we don't care about these very much. Essentially, I think, because the state can step in. But if states A and B um, enter a trade agreement that has bad knock-on effects on state C, um, is that something which state C can legitimately um, object to? Or should we just say, well, actually, states A and B should be free to adopt um, free trade packs and, and state C either has to join, it would be bad if they weren't allowed to join perhaps, um, or just accept um, the consequences. I mean, that's actually a question I'm, I struggle with myself. I probably said too much there. If you engage with any of it, I should be glad. Huge congratulations on your book, Marcus. It's doing everybody a great service, given that we've lived in a world where governments do not care about resilience very much. Many thanks, Paul. And Marcus, would you like to respond directly? So oh, thanks a lot, Paul. This is a fantastic comment. Actually, you know, very much, I had a slide on uh, autocracies versus open democ democratic societies. And I was arguing that, you know, autocracies were much more focused on seeking robustness. Um, and this might not, might be like the oak, might be less long lasting than a democratic society, which is much more resilient. So. Even though one, you know, people argue, you know, in the COVID crisis, it's not clear that, that uh, many, some democracies reacted so well or in the global financial crisis or also January 6th. Uh, this, but overall, I believe like you that, you know, the democracy, there's more information flow, there's more transparency. You allow for certain mavericks and you also react uh, to this. So it's, it seems more wobbly like the read, but in the long run, it will actually be, uh, a safer way to do things and that will be more resilient. Uh, very much why do governments don't really go for resilience? It's, uh, I discussed that a little bit in terms of communication as well. It's typically very hard to convey the counterfactual uh, ex ante to the population. That makes it harder to, to do. So if you want to convey to the uh, people that we do this particular measure, this will make our system more resilient, we will bounce back. It is very hard to communicate that and convince the public. That's what actually what's happening. It's much easier to communicate it once you see the crisis and the crisis playing out, and then you have to do crisis exposed measures. Um, I very much agree with your short-term versus long-term term structure of resilience. I have not touched on this in the book. I mentioned it uh, in that I'm very worried that you know what we're doing right now is actually fixing uh, the, the crisis response 
but once we have to raise interest rates, there might be some uh, you know, phenomenon we cannot control so easily, and we might face some severe uh, challenges there. In terms of geopolitics, I think the last point you mentioned about the tuna externalities I reminded me of the nuclear submarine uh, deal, which just came up at the expense of the third country, France. And I guess um, that's you know, a classic example where one probably should have a more collaborative uh, spirit in order to internalize these externalities, perhaps not fully internalized, but at least find a way to communicate in order to you know, work stronger together in this sense. But overall, thanks a lot. Uh, Fantastic comments. I will digest. Perhaps you can exchange views subsequently more deeply about that. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. There are already a couple of questions and remarks in the in the Q and A. Um, here comes the first from Frank Westhoff. Um, the concept of resilience seems understandable on a macro level, but may I ask where the difference between robustness and resilience on the level of a single corporate, corporate or bank is? Aren't buffers more the same as an oak than a willow? And if used due to financial shocks, they are not redeployable. How do you see that? Yeah, so, so robustness is essentially you have, uh, you have a redundancy for each possible shock. So you think of all possible shocks which can happen and for each you have essentially the uh, redundancy necessary. Your resilient system is much more that, you know, you might have not redundancy, a dedicated redundancy for each possible shock, but you have some more general uh, flexible redundancy, which can employ accordingly. So you might still face a shock. You have to modify uh, this uh, buffers you have in order to employ it. So you face the shock, but then you can come back. And one example I use in the book is some material example essentially is if you look at skyscrapers. So they're not built this, the way that you, you know, they have very sturdy, whatever wind it is, they actually give in quite a lot and they're resilient and they bounce back uh, in this. And this way you save a lot of redundancies by giving in and making it make them swing in the winds. And uh, this actually allows one to have fewer redundancies such that the skyscraper can be built in the first place. If you want to build a skyscraper which doesn't move at all and is totally sturdy, is totally robust against any winds, you couldn't build it because the weight of the skyscraper would be so large that it would uh, fall on its own uh, weight. So that's how I feel it. But I think what I find more fascinating on a societal level is that it's not a very exogenous system. It's not a one person. It's really a system which reacts based on other people's uh, behavior. So what I do will impact others. They will react to that. That will impact me. And we need a system, an arrangement, such that we don't have this spiraling out of control. And that makes societal resilience uh, different and also more important. And we want to build up a society where these you know, feedback effects and externalities uh, kept under control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a short follow-up by, by Jan Luxich on that. On a micro level, could resilience stem from multi-period level reasonable response other than short-term oriented best response? I think that's... Yes, so, so one, could, one could say that. So it's... Uh, uh, it could be, you could also say a long run best response. Uh, and of course you have more room if you say, okay, I'm actually giving in. So I, you can take the long run more into account if you don't try very, very hard to minimize the short run impact. So there are two ways uh, you can think of this as well. You say, I have the short run response, the optimal response is just, I really want to minimize the impact in the short run, but I forgo long term uh, benefits so have some damages down the road, but our, the resilient approach would be in the short run I notice and I have to recognize that I have some impact, but I do what's actually good at the interim and a long term and don't only focus on the short term to minimize the shock. I rather would like to have, want to be able to bounce back and come back to my new normal. Might not be the old normal, might be a new normal where, you know, I actually end up in a situation where I have to use vaccines or have to use something else and go back to a new normal. Okay, Gerd Häusler has a comment, or a comment, I think, on the problems of the US Treasury market in March 22 that you were 
uh, saying. Uh, in his view, that, had, that has less to do with any doubt as to treasuries being safe assets, but rather with the setup of the treasury market. A small number of primary dealers combined with recently introduced banking regulation caused the shortage of potent market players to mop up treasuries when needed. A recent group of 30 reports spelled out the problems and possible solution in detail. Yeah. So I agree with you that it depends how one defines a safe asset. So I agree, it's definitely part of the regulatory environment which made it necessary for any bank which acted as a market maker for the US treasuries to put some capital aside and then they withdrew from the market making business. But part of a safe asset is that whenever you face a shock, you can easily trade it back and forth. So people often want to hold it because of this uh, ease of trading. Uh, you know, I face a shock, you face a different shock, our country faces a shock, our firm faces a different shock, and you can easily trade it. If this ease of trading is going away in times of crisis, then actually that's a problem. And then it becomes much less of a safe asset if you don't have this ease of trading. And that's why actually you could either fix the regulatory framework, which I think was at least to some extent done uh, temporarily, uh, or you can, uh, you know, step in as a market maker of last resort. And often central banks had this feature that they actually made sure that the government bond serves as a safe asset. Um, in this case, it was not only a market maker of last resort and, you know, bridging temporarily some selling pressure with buying up, but they also bought up and held it on their books and in reserve, I mean, uh, issued uh, bank reserves in exchange to it. Mm -hmm. And we come to the more social or societal side of uh, resilience. Christine Riedmann Streitz asks if we think society as community, what are the factors that enable the society as community to become more resilient? So, the way I describe in the book resilience and, uh, you know, a society is in several levels. So, we have essentially at the global level, as, as Paul pointed out, we have to have some. Uh, arrangement, some uh, understanding how to interact and minimize externalities and feedback externalities and tipping points and all this at, at the global level. And then we go at the national level or European level, at the national level, and then we have at a city level or even in each firm, we must have certain understanding. And that's all part of society. In all of these elements, we should look out for shocks and where we don't have the resilience and, and enhance the resilience in all its levels. And if there's an arrangement among people within the same community uh, to help each other out, that's uh, enhancing the resilience in this sense. And so we should promote that. Uh, in, and it also take into account that people then given this resilience, they might be more willing to take other risks, enhance overall well-being for everybody because they're now willing to take more risks and that has positive spillover effects to the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, Thomas Meyer who says, you did not mention fragility, a concept introduced by Nazim Taleb. Are, your, are not robustness and resilience both needed to avoid fragility? And have we not created a high degree of fragility by running up huge public and private debt and pushed interest rates to counterproductive low levels? I think you called it the reversal rate. <clears throat> yes. So indeed, I mean, fertility is, is another concept. So it's tightly linked to it's the opposite of uh, resilience, where it, the situation, the system can be fragile. Um, fragility and vulnerability, essentially, the <clears throat> more static concept saying, oh, this system is now fragile. Uh, resilience is a particular way to overcome fragility. So robust is a particular way to avoid fragility. Resilience is a particular way where you say, okay, I might give in to a shock, but I have the ability to bounce back. And that was important to my thinking, you know, uh, should we go for robustness? And I think that's not feasible. We can only handle a few number of shocks with, with robustness. We can handle a way broader variety of shocks, even unknown shocks, we don't know each other if we go for a resilient arrangement. And that's why I pushed for this, but both of robustness and resilience are just possible responses to fragile societies. And, uh, but I'm tilting towards a resilient uh, arrangement. Mm -hmm. Also asking on the conceptual uh, side, uh, Ingrid Grössel uh, says, I don't think that risk management resilience are opposing terms because risk management does not only 
imply the avoidance of risk, but also risk mitigation, risk coping. Don't you think that both relate closely to resilience? Yes, so essentially risk management depends whether you have a more short-term view or long-term view. Resilience takes a more the long-term view where I would say risk management in a narrow sense or in a short-term view, you just avoid amplification. So there's an initial shock and then it's amplified. And you try to do things in order to either avoid the initial shock or reduce the amplification. Resilience is more about what you do after the shock, how to make sure that actually you bounce back. And that's what I would like to emphasize. And in a broader sense, it's all part of risk management. Because you have resilience, you can take on more risk. And you have to be aware that occasionally you will actually um, uh, face some uh, setbacks. But as long as you come back, it's not a big deal. Or it's, it might be a big deal. But if you have the ability to come back, it's much less of a deal than if you're stuck. And um, what I also describe, you can even see certain recessions if the recession is based on an exogenous shock, comes from outside, typically we come back very quickly. If the recession is driven because some imbalances were building up through, you know, before the global financial crisis, the system is much less resilient. And I have a chart on Japan where you see the banking crisis and all the financial crises, they're much less resilient. So the crisis or the economy is less resilient to a crisis shock if there's some imbalances building up ex ante. So we have to avoid these type of recessions. If the recession is driven by a high interest rate by the Fed or some exogenous shock or Fukushima in Japan, you bounce back very quickly. And so we have to really distinguish between different types of shocks, depending how resilient they are. Mm -hmm. So here comes a very tricky question by Deki Sato asking on the risk avoidance path in figure 1.3. Okay. Uh, your explanation was crystal clear and truly informative. However, I think the riskless straight line could fluctuate. Namely, it also should be volatile in actuality. As Paul yeah. referred, the short and long-term viewpoints must be different. What do you think about the movement of risk avoidance path as time goes by? Yeah, so essentially I made it probably too stark and too stylized. I made the risk avoidance zero risk, but of course there's no such thing in the real world where there's zero risk and even the risk avoidance path has some risk attached to it. Uh, perhaps I should have made it uh, more realistic uh, in this sense. I just wanted to make it very stark where say you have one path which you know has higher, seems to be much more risky and it bounces back, but it has a high expected growth path as well. And there's another path which is, seems way less risky, but in the long run, we're much worse off. And you know, if you compare, so Craig uh, discussed uh, the book early on, he said, oh, if you compare India with Thailand, for example, you see in the South East Asia, a lot of these countries had a much higher growth path, but then had occasionally a big crisis. But if you look, detect the long run perspective, they have a, a much higher uh, uh, income per person uh, than India has, for example. And that because it took on some more risk and it leads to some uh, a higher growth path in expectations, even though it might be more volatile, as long as it's resilient, it is a better way to go. Then um, as to the practical application of the concept, uh, Francesco Mogelli uh, re refers to the um, um, safety nets that the EU has uh, set up mm -hmm. in response to common to the to the to the obvious shocks. So the, the safety nets of a volume of 540 billion euros and of course the new generation EU fund with uh, 750 billion. Are these resilience enhancing in your view and how might we get as much resilience as possible from the na national recovery plans? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's, there are certain aspects where you can enhance resiliency by having a mutual insurance arrangement when one person suffers a bigger shock or one nation suffers a bigger shock than another nation. And in this particular case, in the COVID case, so if, I think it depends very much how the resources are spent. If they're spent wisely and it helps certain nations to come out of a malaise and get growth rate again, I think everybody will be happy. If it's not spent wisely and it just seems to be wasted, then it actually will backfire big time later on. So it's really important that uh, you know, so Italy is spending this, this resources wisely, and I think they're aware of that. That's a great opportunity. 
in a sense, this was actually a danger that things would spiral out of control. It's at least um, what I hear from my Italian friends. There was an understanding or a feeling that Europe was leaving Italy alone in the early phase of the COVID crisis. And there was a sense uh, that they said, why should we be part of the European Union or the Euro if there's no solidarity at all? And, and for that, I think it was very, very crucial and important that uh, Europe did that and showed some solidarity in order to get a sense of community and, and ensuring each other. And, um, and I think that was important, but I think it's equally important that the money is now spent wisely and it will lead to some growth enhancement in Italy. If not, uh, there might be some backfire later on and might make things even worse. Okay. Thank you. Then Thomas Fehrmann asks, are central bank rates in respect to shocks endogenous or exogenous? Um, so it, it's, it's probably both. So central banks, uh, of course, the natural, the, the, our style, the natural rate is moving with shocks. And so is the real interest rate is moving with shocks. Uh, but of course, central banks react to shocks as well. So it is a combination of both. And to the, to the extent the central bank is reacting, it can mitigate the shock, which then makes the underlying uh, natural rate also mm -hmm. uh, you know, fluctuating less because the central bank is reacting with that. Yeah, that thank you. Uh, we, <laughs> so we talked already about the EU rescue packages. There, there is, of course, the inevitable question in these days from, from Germany. Uh, Jan Radermacher asks, uh, or reminds us that the federal election is coming up uh, next mm -hmm. Sunday. Which parties and or concrete comp proposals will help us to become a more resilient society in Germany? Would you like to comment on that? <laughs> no, I don't want to go into politics. So I think you know, the book tries to stay uh, you know, more on a conceptual level what we should do. And uh, I think there's probably in every party, there are some elements of resilience, but I think there's also way more things which could be done for every party to make the society more resilient. For me personally, it's very important that the society is agile and takes the challenges and reacts to it and prepares uh, for it and not to avoid the risk. So there is a danger that you go into what's referred to, we just go for low risk environments and that might actually lead down the road to, to a bad outcome because we don't take the challenges uh, we are facing. So we have to take the challenges we are facing. And if you face a shock, so take into account that there might be a temporary shocks, we have to react to it and adjust and modify and we should be willing to be agile and flexible and the flexibility and also accepting, you know, people who think differently, who come up with solutions. And I think the Germans can be very proud that they have developed the mRNA vaccines. There's a real, a huge achievement which is you know, benefiting the whole world. And this sense, that's a sign which way Germany should go, essentially. Thank you. May, may I perhaps ask Paul what he thinks about the uh, discussion, in, in, be it in Europe or in Germany, on how to arrive at a more resilient society? Two, two very quick points. One about the German election, one going back to the um, very first question. Um, The second time that Germany in, re in recent history adopted a grand coalition, my internal response was that that was very risky um, because it risked um, fermenting the development of parties on the extreme right, on the extreme left. Now, it looks as though your country, thank God, because it's the most important country in our part of the world, is going to survive this. But I, I think that whatever the expedience in the short run, I think it was um, not, actually, I thought it was reckless, certainly not um, resilient, sensitive to adopt, adopt a grand coalition time and again and risk alienating the population from both CDU and the um, SPD. Um, on, on banking, um, I think the first question was about kind of what's the difference between robustness and resilience in banking. And I can tell a story about this. So there are very prominent academics in Germany friends of mine, not, not Marcus, who um, argued for much higher equity requirements for banks, but also at the same time against um, there being resolution policies. 
And I asked these people, both in Germany and elsewhere in the world, okay, say you, say you get your way and there are um, higher equity requirements, but no other um, policies. And one day there's a shock big enough that all the equity is exhausted. What then? Silence. So I say, so in those circumstances, you would need a resolution policy. Yes, kind of grudgingly um, conceded. I said, well, if you need it at almost any level of equity, you need it at a lower level of equity. And that more equity is basically a policy of robustness. And look, I'm, I'm very much part of a gang that increased equity requirements. Resolution policies and bail-in debt are essentially about resilience. They are, they are about allowing a bank to be revived in some form without junking the background norms of capitalism and free markets that equity holders get, get bailed out. Um, so I offer that uh, as an example of a real-time contest where there was one group of very eminent people arguing for a policy that relied entirely on robustness and another group of people who happened to include uh, me, because I, I was the godfather of the bail-in policy in a way, um, promoting a resilience um, um, strategy. And so this can really, these choices um, crop up in real life in big policy debates where reasonable um, people have big disagreements. And I think what Marcus is doing is helping to frame that and scores of other debates in terms of what do we want to do here in terms of resilience or robustness and do we want resilience or resilience today potentially be at the cost of resilience tomorrow and i think that's a i think that's a tremendous um gift from marcus to the rest of us mm -hmm. thank you very much and i see that jan has also yeah i i, I tried to post it in the chat but i couldn't so let me ask it <laughs> directly um, to Marcus. So I, I mean, this is completely convincing the story about this resilient society, but going forward, looking in the future, how much do we have to know about the type of shock that society will hit in order to construct a system that exposed has been resilient? So, so that's the question. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an advantage of resilience compared to robustness, because for robustness, I really have to know all the shocks and prepare for these various shocks. While resilience means I have some flexible reserve units or, and then whatever the shock is, I will just modify. It will take a while. I have to get the hit because I have to modify my reserve units and then employ it accordingly and get back. Uh, so it's essentially on the one hand, I need fewer redundancies, but I need flexible redundancies. So I can, whatever the shock is, I can modify this redundancy in order to address the initial shock. And but I need to know, I need to know, uh, so I need to know the type. Of, so let, let's take your oak and reed example, right? So if it's a wind, then I know yes. that. But what it, if it's a lightning or a fire? Or I mean, well, there are different types of shocks and resilience may be differently defined there. That's what I mean. What I mean. Yes, so I would say that if I have redundancies which are flexibly redeployable, I need to know less because they are flexible, whatever the shock is. If I have a robustness approach and for each type of shock, I need a particular redundancy, then it's, I need to know way more. So there might be some shocks I don't can foresee at all and my flexible redundancy is not helping me, but a flexible redundancy might take a while to adjust in order to respond to it, but it covers more shocks. So it's actually much better covering unknown, unknown, shocks in a sense and that's that's i think a one big advantage of the resilience concept as well but it does it cover all of them probably not do you have to look out for things where you go beyond a tipping point yes so because i might be hit and then i cannot react right away and i go beyond a tipping point so then resilience is of a handicap so in general i would say resilience covers more shocks but there are certain dangerous you know shocks i have to really look out for mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, th there's a question by, and I would say that's the last question from the from the Q and A here. The question by Wolfgang Wühler uh, on the difference between resilience and resistance. Uh, shouldn't uh, a society or an economy like an individual have a resilient and a resistant component, depending on the nature, on the size or nature of an external or endogenous shock to survive in the long term? So doesn't it need both? 
Yes, um, hi Wolfgang. So it's it's good to have resistance to shocks where you would cross a tipping point. So I would resistance and robustness. I would uh, put uh, very close to each other, and I would say if there's a shock which then leads once across the tipping point and then it spirals out of control. For these type of shocks, I really need resistance. So I need to make sure that, you know, things are not bending at all. There's no giving in. Um, if I have other shocks where I can actually manage it well by, you know, phasing the shock, being hit and bouncing back, uh, for that, I think I would take resilience. So one has to ex ante, look at the shocks and then build resilience through redundancies, which are flexibly employment and essentially for shocks, which lead to these feedback effects, I would like to have them resistance or really avoid any amplification in the first place. Yeah, and then the very last uh, question, I would say from the, from the uh, audience here by Rudi Schad, insurance may be a good analogy. Insurance asks for mitigating risk re reducing behavior. Uh, uh, require drivers to wear a seatbelt, but still build reserves to ensure the remaining tail risk, which is then resilience. Huh? Yes, so you would like to, to ensure the... So insurance is, is, is one way, in particular, if you have shocks, people have different shocks, they can insure each other. It helps in particular for idiosyncratic shocks, but if it's a systematic shock hitting the whole society in one, uh, then you cannot really, through insurance, it won't uh, help. And there's also different philosophy in terms of resilience. If I face a shock, will it just be compensated by facing the shock? Or will it, will it just help me to uh, get out of the hole, as I mentioned earlier? So I'll give you a particular example. If I get unemployed, is the emphasis on getting a, a paycheck or is the emphasis that I get some reskilling? that I will be helped to adjust to the new environment and come back and I can become more easily employed again. And resilience is the latter because I make somebody who is unemployed able to bounce back rather than just giving him money and pay him off. And I think that's also a big difference in terms of dignity, uh, bringing people back into society rather than you know, just paying them off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many thanks, Marcus. Also many thanks to Paul and to the uh, audience for the discussion and I would now invite Otmar Ising to share uh, the concluding remarks. Otmar? Okay, uh, I think the seminar has confirmed what Jan said in his introduction. Marcus, Marcus Brunemeyer uh, is a, uh, combines, uh, is a rare, situ rare combination of uh, on the one hand, um, being a head of research in quite a number of fields and being able to explain uh, his message in, I would say, plain language without any compromise on the string stringency of arguments. I think this is, this is key. Uh, as the discussion has shown, um, we could continue arguing with him, discussing with him for, for quite a while. Unfortunately, there's uh, no time. So just two uh, observations. First, uh, Marcus, when you started with a picture of the oak and the reed, uh, so uh, the concept of bouncing back, uh, of bouncing back immediately raises a question to what status uh, uh, and probably not to the status uh, before the shock hit. Uh, so um, resilience implies the ability of the system to adapt uh, to uh, the risks um, coming from the shock. Uh, the shock which lays open the, the fragility, to use this term, of the system uh, and uh, this adoption of the system has to happen on the micro as well as on the macro level. And uh, it was interesting to see that uh, Paul, uh, for me not surprising, uh, came in and referring to the broader context of politics, even geopolitics. And so, but extending in this direction is uh, almost a work, uh, which is a, a lifelong. A challenge, uh, but I think the dimension uh, 
has to be uh, <clears throat> taken into account. And uh, Paul also made an interesting remark on combining politics and trade. Uh, this reminded me of um, um, Graham Allison, uh, which is to quit it as Trump. So I think this is a combination of many economic factors, psychological factors, etc., and uh, geo geopolitics. So uh, I think I'm looking forward to the discussion with Paul and probably hopefully including you uh, next year when uh, Paul has published his book. Uh, Marcus, a, a final remark. Um, you touched upon it uh, shortly. Uh, you made outstanding research on financial dominance. Uh, and you said what you see, implied risk of uh, low interest rates, etc. Uh, risk taking. Uh, could it be that if uh, financial dominance continues and continues, we will come to a tipping point, to a kind of tipping point, when an outcome of such a situation uh, is unavoidably uh, connected with uh, tremendous uh, financial problems? Uh, inflation or whatever, even to uh, undermining the reputation of institutions. Uh, so um, with, with the great risk, uh, I, I think I, I stop here because uh, it's uh, so tempting to con continue along this line. Marcos, uh, as always, you leave us uh, with thought provoking ideas we will discuss, I'm certain, among us, uh, a number of the points you raised. And I can only congratulate you on your new book. And thank you for sharing uh, with us your views on uh, the resilience of society. Probably one of them, this, uh, I, I think, includes in a term the challenges for our societies uh, in these times of crisis, uh, one after the other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcus, you would like to respond to the financial dominance? Thank, thanks a lot, Otmar, as always. Uh, great points. Let me just say two things. One is, you know, bouncing back to a new normal. I think it's very important that you just, we don't want to just go back to the old thing. And, you know, one simple example is working from home. I think we will just bounce back to new things. And often a crisis is also an opportunity to come out of some lock-in effect. We might be locked in for a while and suddenly we can actually bounce back or we might have new vaccines against malaria, there might be different ways to treating cancers much more. So there's a huge opportunity uh, from each crisis as well. And the second point, I uh, think coming financial dominance, I'm very uh, concerned about that uh, and I agree with you. And it's very difficult to engineer a soft landing. And the higher you fly, the more difficult it is. And essentially, one has to be aware of that and uh, prepare for that uh, uh, early on. And perhaps don't fly so high in order to uh, achieve a more soft landing. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the end of this uh, seminar. I, I think we have. Uh, experienced a very lively discussion on that on that fascinating topic of uh, resilience and the concept of a resilient society. So many thanks to Marcus for uh, bringing in his uh, views and uh, good luck for the further uh, selling of the book. <laughs> uh, many thanks to Paul Tucker for his uh, comments. And uh, we, as uh, Ottmar Issing uh, pointed out, we look very much forward to your new book. And we'd be happy to also host a seminar once it has come out uh, next year. Uh, thanks to Ottmar Ising for the final remarks and uh, thanks to um, Jan Kranen also for the welcome. So on behalf of uh, CFS and SAFE, I thank all the participants, the audience, the discussants and uh, wish you a pleasant evening. Bye-bye from Franklin. Thanks, Diana. Oh. Thanks, Jan. Thanks.